Okay, take two. Welcome to the online October Discovering History Seminar. I'm Dr. Ruth Ford, Senior Lecturer in the History Program at La Trobe University. Um, just some housekeeping before I introduce the speakers. Um, if you can please mute and at question time, you can ask the questions via chat or you can raise your hand via the participant button. The session is being recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded while asking a question, you can ask via the chat and I'll repeat the question anonymously. So um, these seminars are a collaboration between La Trobe University, the Bendigo Regional Archive Centre, the Goldfields Library and the Golden Dragon Museum. Before I introduce the speakers, I'd like to acknowledge the Jaja Wurrung as the traditional custodians of the land we're on and that sovereignty was never ceded. La Trobe University recognises the Jaja Wurrung's ongoing connection to the land and acknowledges elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge the Nurai Ilum Wurrung as the traditional custodians of the country east of the Campaspe river extending across to beyond the Goulburn River um, and that sovereignty was never ceded. So I'd like to welcome Elder Vin Peters who's speaking tonight and acknowledge other Nurai Ilum Wurrung elders past and present. I'd also like to pay my respects to any other Indigenous participants here this evening and if you're on other country I'd encourage you to post an acknowledgement of that um, to the chat so that we can kind of see what's the diversity of nations that we're on. The format for tonight is that the speakers um, will speak for 40 minutes and then we'll have 20 minutes of questions and discussion. So um, it now gives me very great pleasure to introduce Narai Ilam Wurrung Elder Uncle Vin Peters and also local historian Tony Ford, who are going to present on the forgotten people. Uncle Vin Peters is a Narai Ilum Wurrung Elder who's been active in working to maintain the culture of his people and he has a vast knowledge of his people's history. Tony Ford is a local historian with a special interest in the area, which encompassed um, the former Shire of Warunga, based in Rushworth. And is the current focus of Tony's research and writing is um, the Narai Ilam Wurrung people, and he's been working with Vin. So I'm going to hand over to Vin first. Um, Tony first. Oh, Tony first. Okay. <laughs> Okay, a flip. No worries. I'm going to hand over to Tony first then. Thanks, Tony. What I was saying, I'll cut this short, but just wanted to acknowledge country, uh, endorsing Ruth's remarks uh, and say that I'm talking from Jaja Wurrung country. Um, like to acknowledge the Jaja Wurrung people as the traditional owners and custodians of this land and its waterways. And I'd like to make a special mention to Auntie Marilyn Nichols. She gave me my first basket making lesson about four years ago in Malden and uh, it's helped to keep me partially sane during all the lockdowns that we've had so um, it's been a great exercise. Um, I'd also like to welcome any other elders or other Aboriginal people who have, are listening in tonight and acknowledge the the links within the Kulin Nation. The um, Jaja Wurrung and the Nurayel of Wurrung were closely linked through the Kulin Nation and had very similar language. There was intermarriage and so forth, which you'll hear more about as we go through. Um, there are some images of deceased people within the um, PowerPoint. So we're just um, providing that information to uh, people that may affect. Right, a little bit of my background. Um, I grew up in Satura and um, when I started at Tatura school, school in the early 60s, um, they just started a house system. Um, the first two houses were Batman and Henty, um, and later they decided, saw fit to add Mitchell and Sturt. So that just gives you a little bit of an idea of where my education was coming from. And I'd been aware, but hadn't done anything about it for a long time, that um, most of my formal education didn't mention Aboriginal history and it was something that I 
uh, had put on the back burner and when I got to retirement, it was something that I wanted to spend time working on. And one of the things that we were learning at school at the time was um, public, and it's shown by the fact that they named the houses those things, was that um, there was this line of history that we were all receiving um, where there was a benign settlement of Australia. Um, the doctrine of Terra Nullius was still alive and well at that stage. Um, and the settlers moved in and it was just, a, you know, worked hard to create a new country. Uh, that was the sort of message that was coming through. And governments often try to do that. Um, and this has been talked about by historians over a period of time. And um, in an excellent book by Katka Kasilova, she talks about the syndrome of selective national memory. That's the biscuit factory line of history. I mean, the standard set of history that we all get uh, as we go through the school system. Um, and it favours homogeneity over ambiguity. Now, the sort of history that I've been looking at over the last few years, there's lots of ambiguity. There's lots of conflict. Um, there's a lot of misinformation. Um, so, but it, it also challenges uh, that, that sort of education that I was getting in the early days. So, I just wanted to make you aware of that. And in 2017, um, I was working on, in something that's very much in the this factory line of history. In other words, the Anzac legend um, and the people who perpetuate that legend at the moment are experts at it, and, but it's very much in that biscuit factory line of history and it's very lucrative um, when you see that the Australian War Memorial has just received $500 million for extension um, and they don't happen to mention the wars that Aboriginal people were involved in, but it makes you wonder uh, about how those process, processes are still in play. So I was in Rushworth, living in Rushworth at the time and doing some research on World War I and local people who went to the war, etc. cetera. Um, and I was working my way through the local papers and in November 1917, I came across this little cutting. Uh, the picture wasn't there, it was just a cutting. It said King Billy, an old Aboriginal who was born in the main street of Rushworth 62 years ago, paid a visit to his native place during the week. And it talked about him. The paper said that he claims to be the last of the Rushworth tribe of Aborigines. Um, whether he said that or not um, remains to be seen. It might have been just something that that's what people used to say, um, he's the last of the tribe and uh, not necessarily the case. So I started doing research and picking up as much information as I could. Uh, that sparked my interest and started to pick up as much information as I could about the Aboriginal people in the Rushworth and surrounding area. There were snippets of information that the locals were aware of, um, but it wasn't the focus really. Um, most people in the area considered that uh, the history of the area started with the gold rush and in the selectors came in and so forth. Um, so I was collecting a vast amount of information. As it turned out, we think there's, you know, may not be much information about the Aboriginal history of an area, but it actually turns out that there's a huge amount of information out there. And I was starting to collect a whole lot of information and learn about what had happened in this area. Um, then, Reconciliation Week 2018 happened. And um, the theme for that was don't keep history a mystery, learn, which I felt I'd been doing a fair bit of, share and grow. So I started to think about the second of those words, share part, and thinking about a way that I could share the information um, that I was learning with the local community that I was a part of. The way that I uh, eventually Chose to do that was through the local fortnightly community newspaper and started writing a series of stories, um, around about six words each. Uh, and that's been running for about three years. Uh, it wasn't meant to be a comprehensive history of the Aboriginal history of the area because that's almost an impossibility. But 
It was bringing out lots of these little bits of information uh, that were coming up. Um, so once a fortnight, about 24 issues a year, that information comes out. The locals have a read and they're starting to get a bit of an appreciation of the Aboriginal history of the area. Um, a lot of the people won't buy a history book and read a history book, but we'll read the local paper from cover to cover. Um, and that seems to be a good way to get the information out there. I wasn't just doing this off my own bat. I'd, I'd um, consulted widely and collaborated with uh, elders. Um, when it became obvious that Nure Alamwarung people were uh, the original custodians of the area, I went about finding the elders and spoke to uh, the elders, but I had a uh, good knowledge of local Aboriginal. So um, from there, I met Uncle Vin, who's going to speak to you in a moment. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce him to talk about his people. Vin's picture here at a grave that he'll, he'll talk about, but the grave of the gentleman photo on, on the left, um, to Tambo and his second wife, Mary. So, Vin, at this point, I'll hand over to you, to you to talk about your people, and then Vin will throw back to me later, and I'll give you a, a brief journey through Norayel of Aram country. Thanks. Thanks, Vin. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Um, I'm speaking to you from Woiwurrung country, uh, the land of the, the Wurundjeri. And um, our family has lived on Woiwurrung country since we were removed from um, our country in the Goulburn Valley and uh, removed and sent to Corinderic Mission Station. And um, so we've been here since the 1860s. Um, some of the members of the Nure and Wurrung people still live in the local area around Marubna. This is a, um, a, a picture of a, a Bangarang and Uralum, um, uh corroboree. And Uralum was uh, just another name for Nurel and Wurrung. Um, it turned out that there were three different tribal groups along the Goulburn River. But before the Goulburn River was the Goulburn River, uh, with the three different tribal groups, there were two language groups. One of the language groups was Bangarang. Today we call them Yorta Yorta. They had their own language. The other group um, was a Kulin, uh, two Kulin language or two Kulin nations groups. And they were Nurela Murang and Tanarong. Tanarong were from the upper uh, Goulburn region from Seymour to sort of Mansfield and further. And Nurela Murang we're basically from Talamba uh, down to Seymour on the Goulburn River and across to the Camp Aspie. Um, the corroboree we we're looking at, we're at it was actually painted by um, the daughter-in-law of William Lesouf. William Lesouf was the man who had actually um, set up the protectorate station at Murchison. And his daughter-in-law um, did this painting. Uh, she married uh, William's son, Albert Lesouf. Albert Lesouf later on went on to, um, to become a member of the Board of Protection for Aborigines. So there's a connection with the painting uh, in many different ways. Next slide, please, Tony. When I, um, we've always knew mm. that we were, were Aboriginal. Um, my, my dad was cool on a timber mill and we were living at Healesville. When, I, when we went to shift with, to, with my Nana, she was brought up on uh, uh, Corran Dirk Mission Station. And um, she later on married a man who was from Kamragunja. And um, 
Whilst we knew which mission stations we came from, Corindirk and Gumragunja, we didn't always know um, what were our family connections. Uh, we did know that we came from Kamragunja and that we were Yorta Yorta, however, but the rest of the tribes weren't known. And um, in, in 2013, after I retired, I went into the Melbourne Museum and there were pictures of our families all over the walls. And um, this picture was one of them and the others you'll see later. So, um, Many historians had actually uh, did stories on our family and I, there was plenty of things to read. And the museum provided me with uh, many photographs, genealogies and historical stories. One of the things that they got wrong though, they said that Tatambo died in 1866 and he didn't, he actually died in, in 1868. And you might think, well, that doesn't really matter that much. But it turned out in the inter intervening period, people made up stories that weren't true. And it actually set our family history on a wrong path. So this is um, King Charles Tatambo, is his name. And he was the leader of the tribe in that time. And uh, the first time that he'd saw or seen white men is he was on his own country and they came up through the Mitchellstown region and they were crossing the river. And they were, they were um, lighting fires in front of them to try and deter them, but it didn't work. They just kept coming. And um, then that was uh, uh, the human hobble crew in uh, 1824. And the next time um, was 1836. And that was uh, Major Mitchell with his crew coming through the, on the same route crossing around the, the, the same area of the river. And um, a, again, they were trying to turn people back, but uh, were, weren't successful. A short while after, um, uh, squatters starting, started to come through and, and take over the land. So people were, were noticing how their land was being infiltrated and um, so that was, it was quite a, a disappointment. Now, I've written a lot of story in these slides. Um, when we started to actually, what we started to do as a family was to try and let people know who they were. And we reconnected with people from all over Australia who used to be um, li live in Melbourne, who also have the same heritage. So they all wanted to know more details of the story. So I've written up the story with the, with the slides and the images that I've got. And um, so every now and again, we find a new family member. They want to know their story. And um, so we send them off these slides. And so you're seeing some of those slides with that detail. Next slide, please, Tony. What happened was um, a guy called Edward Mick Migglethwaite Kerr, and many of you may even know of him. He actually was a, one of the first squatters in the area, and he set up Tongala Station that was on the Goulburn River. And the map actually shows um, where Tongala Station was. Um, it's up near the top on the Goulburn River. And um, he, took, he used the, uh, the name Tongala because on the Murray River, that the section of the Murray River where the, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the tribe, I can't think of it. That's the, the language used by the people in that, in that area on the Murray River um, called the Murray River Tongala, but he liked it so much, that's what he called his station even though he was on the Goulburn. So he just propped himself on the Goulburn River and set up his station. And um, it was as if nobody else lived there. And the Aborigines weren't going to move, so they just stayed on their property. And later on, he was able to actually see um, um, a, that uh, a corroboree very similar to the one I showed you in the first picture. So, um, 
later on, uh, he became a, also became a member of the Board of Protection for Aborigines, and he wrote um, quite a, a famous book in, uh, in in this area called The Australian Race. And uh, before that, he wrote Recollections of Squatting in Victoria. And within Recollections of Squatting in Victoria, he actually talks about our tribe, about how they were preparing for the, um, the corroboree. And um, he talked about the dignity of the people and the bearing of the people. And um, I had tears in my eyes when I first read this story because growing up, you don't hear a lot of, well, you didn't hear a lot of positive stories about Aboriginal people. And we didn't talk about it. And you, you, you talked about it in the family, but you wouldn't mention it out in public. Uh, it's something you kept quiet. But thankfully, we've moved on a lot since then. And particularly the last 20 years or so, people have become interested in knowing what the real history was. And this is uh, an important part of that history. So a man who went and squatted on uh, Aboriginal land, um, 40 years later, he's, he's written these books and he's a member of the Board of Protection for Aborigines. And um, he actually did this map and it's only uh, a guide map of where the languages were spoken. It's not ac actually accurate. As a, as a map itself, as you can tell by the, the straight lines. Uh, could we go to our next slide, please, Tony? And I often wondered, how could you do that? How could you, could you imagine doing that today, rocking up to somebody's country with your ship and, your, and, um, and just pulling up on their shore, putting a flag in the sand and saying, well, now this is, I claim this country in the name of Queen or King so-and-so. Well, it was quite common. Um, the British did it all over the world. And this map actually shows the countries that they did it in. And um, so I, I wondered why they would do it. So we're looking at the British Empire all in red. And it, it actually, the idea came from religious ideas. And it was called the Doctrine of Discovery. And uh, in the 15th century, Pope Nicholas, um, uh, the 5th of 1452, he actually declared the doctrine of discovery. Uh, at that time, uh, there was a, everybody in the world who was Christian was Catholic. And uh, basically the idea of the doctrine of discovery was that because you uh, had this um, pure Christian background, you could go and discover countries all around the world. And if they weren't Christians, and particularly if they were people of a different race, you could actually claim their country. And you could declare it terra nullius. And terra nullius actually is a Roman term that comes right back from the Roman Empire. And it basically meant that that wasn't your land. And um, so I, I, I was astonished that anybody could actually do that. And then later on, that was reconfirmed by Pope Alexander, um, the, um, the, 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 the sixth in 1492. And, um, and then later on, Henry VIII, he actually separated from the Catholic, Catholic Church and um, set up the Protestant Church, uh, became the Church of England, which and the kings and queens were heads of the church. And um, so, um, although they separated from the, from, from the Catholic uh, religion, they still kept terra nullius. And from then on, uh, for hundreds of years, they set up empires around the world. So I was curious to know, because I'd never heard of that. If we see uh, the next slide, please, Tony. So this is the Tatambo family. These photographs, um, originally, I saw them at uh, the Murchison Historic Museum, but they didn't have the, the detail of the story. Uh, it didn't, they didn't know who the photo photographer was. And it turned out the photographer was a chap called Thomas Jeston Washbourne. And he came to this country in 1863. And um, he started taking photographs 
all around the Goulburn region. And this is a family set of photos. And um, uh, there's a, another photo that is not included in this one that actually puts all the photos together. And we're seeing Tatambo in the, in the first photograph. That photograph was taken in about 1867. His wife in the middle, um, Queen Mary, and um, his daughter or their daughter, uh, Jenny, and my great grandmother, um, Lizzie Hylett. And she was the one, she was taken from her family and sent to Corranderk Mission Station on her own in about 1865. Next slide, please, Tony. These are the actual um, photos. I wanted to find them and um, they're actually, they've traveled around the world. And this is a younger picture of Tatambo, uh, not a great deal younger, but a few years and it made the difference. Um, and he's wearing a king plate, but it's not actually at the real king plate. This has been retouched. The photograph couldn't have been good enough to, to show what the details that were on the king plate. So they've just hand um, notated them in. Um, the, uh, the same picture, um, but this came from the British Museum. And the picture on the end was Lizzie and Jenny, the girl in the possum skin cloak. That also came from the British Museum. But they're in the National Library and they're, all, they're, they're also in um, Melbourne Museum and the State Library. Next photo, please, Tony. So this is a close up of Tatambo's um, king plate and reading it is quite astonishing. Tatambo king belonging to Mr. Fryer, Malka Station. And when you think belonging to Mr. Fryer, what does that mean? Well, when the squatters came through um, in that whole area along the Goulburn Valley, um, squatters set up their stations very, very quickly. And they, well, it seemed like there were hundreds of them. Um, they were just, they covered the country. And um, the native people basically stayed where they were. They, they saw no reason to leave. But in the end, uh, because of massacres, which occurred, uh, and there were um, four known massacres that I've found information of, but a lot more people disappeared than is known from those particular massacres. There was a Camp Paspi Plains massacre. There was a massacre at, um, at Nagambi. And um, um, when it said belonging to Mr. Fryer, I, I, I just wondered what that meant. And that turned out it was a safe station. If you were to draw a line between Euroa and Murchison and went halfway, that'd be where Molka Station was. You'd be, you'd be almost right on top of it. Uh, next slide, please, Tony. And this um, map is an Aboriginal map um, set up by um, IATSIS, uh, 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 an Aboriginal uh, uh, educational organization. And um, the Nurail and Wurrung is actually, you can, you can just see them as a small country next to Tanarong um, down in the Victorian region. Next slide, please, Tony. So this is actually a photograph taken in 1866. And these series of photographs are taken by Charles Walter. And um, what you can see um, is uh, the, the three family members are listed there. There's a little girl um, down in the bottom left-hand corner and that's Lizzie. So that's, a year later, after the photo in the possum skin cloak was taken, she finds herself on Corran uh, Mission Station. Um, her um, her mother-in-law is the middle uh, pointer. Um, that's Maggie, uh, Maggie Campbell. Her father was a squatter and she's Jar Jar So she's from the... Uh, the area around Bendigo and uh, the squatter actually set up a, um, a camping ground. His name was Donald Campbell and it was at um, Morong. 
and 20 k's east of Bendigo. And it was set up during the gold rush for all of the miners that were coming through. And his wife was Betty, and this was Maggie's mum. And um, they, they were brought up there. And the, the picture uh, with the pointer on it to the left, far left, um, that's the man that Lizzie married. So he was a boy. He arrived at Corranduik Mission Station in uh, about 1864 with his mother. And um, uh, later on, when they grew up, they, they married in uh, 1878. So that so sort of gives you a, a bit of a history of the people, what happened to them. Not a lot is known about uh, the, the, the life of the family um, before colonization, but there is a fair bit. And um, we've heard where their country was and, and basically they lived off the land and had a, had a comfortable li a living. All of the people, all Aboriginal people did the same. They only took what they needed. So there was always food. And um, yam daisies and possums were quite big for the Nurel and Wurrung people. They also had plenty of fish. Um, now, I, I'm not sure how I'm going for time. I'm hoping somebody's keeping an eye on me, but I think we had planned a bit of a break and Tony was to come back in now. Thanks very much for that, Vim. So over to you again, Tony. I think keep going, Vin. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll keep Three going. Three your slides, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, that little girl in the possum skin cloak, this is her. And she's a young woman. And um, one of the things that Edward Kerr uh, in his book, Recollections of Squatting in Victoria, um, talked about the marriages and the corroboree. And he talked about the dignity of the people, but he actually described them as very good looking people. And um, when I look at this picture of my great grandmother, um, I, I, I see that, uh, a beautiful looking lady. Thanks, Tony. Next slide. So just to refresh your memory, there's the girl in the possum skin cloak. Um, just shortly after that photo was taken, she ended up on Foreign Duke Mission Station. And the next photo, um, here she is a long time later. She's well into her 90s. And um, she was on Corran Dirk Mission Station until well after it closed. It closed in 1924 and her husband died at the age of 78 in 1938. And she had to shift off the station. And um, she was taken in by friends. And on her grave, um, they thought she'd lived to 104. And at the time when it was reported, her death was reported, she was thought to be the oldest person in Victoria. Quite a bit different um, from stories you hear about Aboriginal people uh, dying well before their time these days. And um, she was a fit lady. Um, she in enjoyed her life. and, and um, she, she managed to live for a long time. And um, I, as a child, actually met her. She took me to a circus one time. And she, um, she um, um, I, I met her again later on when I was about, uh, about six, I think, five or six. And um, she was bedridden by that time. And, and um, she died a short while later in 1957. So that's a pretty good lifespan. Um, thank you, Tony. Next slide. Again, trying to think about um, the type of in environment, the social environment people uh, were brought up in. And, and this is a, I came across this poster and it's, it's, it's a poster about the white Australia policy. And so, you know, white Australia, Australia, the white man's land. And, um, and there was a, a concert 
in 1910 and was being advertised and it was uh, celebrating this fact. And um, it's the, um, it was run by ANA and um, ANA stood for Australian, uh, yeah, Australian Aboriginal Natives. And I, and I thought, gee, that was pretty progressive that time. But it turned out um, what it meant was white men, men, white men born in Australia were called uh, Australian Aboriginal Natives. And um, the, it was, a, it was a, an organization for, for white men only, their wives weren't allowed to go. And, um, and they certainly were, um, you know, very discriminatory about who they were. Um, thank you, move on again. Yeah, so what got it all started? This is, these are the original photographs. These are the photographs that were presented to the Murchison Historical Museum in um, uh, 1938, but they'd hung in the Mechanics Institute. The Mechanics Institute uh, at Murchison was actually built in 1875. And um, I'm not sure exactly when these photographs went in, but it's pretty clear that for a long time, the town of Murchison knew who the local native people were. And they were my family. And I can remember walking into the museum for the first time in 2013. I went up there for a book launch by Dr. Ian Clark. He wrote the story on the uh, Goldwyn Protectorate. And um, I th while I had time, I had arrived early. We'd been around to see the graves. You can still see the graves at Murchison Cemetery. And, um, and called into um, the Murchison Historical Society for the first time. And these photos are on the wall. In fact, they had the, had the whole story on the wall. I had tears running down my cheeks and I just said, spoke to one of the curators and said, this is my family. And um, they were really surprised to see us. And they said, we, we thought they were all dead. And I said, well, no, here they are. <laughs> we're here. And um, we survived and we survived through that little girl in the possum skin cloak. Thanks, Tony. Next slide. Yeah, so there's, there are a lot of people um, buried at the Corin Dirk Cemetery and the can doesn't have all of the names, um, but we have many, many members of, of the family. Um, still, the Corin Dirk doesn't operate as a, um, as a, as a station like bit like Kumragunja does, um, but there are people, Aboriginal people living on it. It's, there's only about 230 acres left of the original 4,800 acres. And uh, the cemetery is a small part of it. And um, the uh, Lizzie wasn't allowed to be buried. When she died in 1957, she wasn't allowed to be buried with the rest of her family. She has children buried there. Her husband is buried there. Um, her mother is buried there. And uh, her mother-in-law is buried there. And uh, when she died, she wasn't allowed. That was a, there was a bit of a, a negative kickback at the time. And the people who uh, had the authority to allow burials said, no, you couldn't. So she's actually buried away from her family in, at the Hillsville Cemetery. And um, I, I go up and visit it, um, and her, her daughter is actually, uh, eldest daughter is buried there with her. And, um, and it says on her grave, she's 104. Thank you, Tony. So we, we tell the story um, every now and again. And for the first few years, a lot of the story was new, as I said, we knew we came from Corinderk and from the uh, Cumbragunja mission station, but we didn't know our other connections. So um, once the museum, that when, when I told the museum, Melbourne Museum, who I was, they sent along within a few days um, history uh, information that included genealogies, 
um, going right back. Uh, newspaper reports and uh, photos from noted res uh, or, or extracts from documents from noted researchers and photos. There are lots of um, photos taken at, at Corrindurk in particular, and we are very lucky to have those washbourne photos because there's nothing like it anywhere else that I know of in that in that region. So in the middle, um, in the yellow dress is my auntie Dot, my dad's sister. On the end, um, in the blue t-shirt, is her brother, um, Uncle Eric, and um, uh, the rest of them are elders uh, from uh, uh, cousins, also from with their generations from Corridor. And on the end on the left uh, is my wife, and next to her is Auntie Marg, and she has Scottish heritage. And the rest of the family in the background, uh, we'd, we'd actually uh, prepared uh, slides and information and just told people um, we were having a family history reunion and they all turned up and some of the people we'd never met and we'd had another four family reunions and each time new people turn up and people we hadn't met but we were hugging as family and how we know the stories was through connection stories that the elders had and they were fantastic to have and so everybody took turns in talking about the family history and um, who, who had that knowledge. And one of the um, great stories that is told, just before uh, Lizzie, the girl in the possum skin cloak, was shifted to Corin Dirk, they were living in Avenal. This is um, in the early 1860s. And um, they weren't far from the town, and uh, they're, they're also they called it Mangala. Uh, today, that area is called Mangalore. And uh, so their name for it was Mangala. And the tribe was there, and troopers rode in on horses, and the people um, were in need of food because they weren't allowed to go on squatted stations anymore. A lot, as I said, had been shot and weren't, and weren't allowed to um, be, be on the stations. And um, they had to get food which, any which way that they could. And troopers brought in uh, wine, food and flour uh, and sugar. And the wine was for the men. And what they did was they, they, they got the men drunk. And when they got them well and truly drunk, they started bargaining with the men, the Aboriginal men, for time with their women. In those times, there, there were a shortage of white women um, in the colonies and um, um, the troopers had no women and they would actually um, bargain for uh, a time with the women. And, um, the women didn't um, comply with their wishes, they were belted up. So there were bashings. My great grandmother, she's only a girl of, well, she was seven when she went to Corinderk. So she was pretty young and she was taken from there. Um, she used to get really uh, concerned and she would sneak away from the camp, hearing the women screaming. And um, she would go to a friend's house and um, they took her in. Uh, the friend, uh, they had quite a few daughters in the family and um, she would sleep in the friend's bed with the youngest. And uh, that youngest, her name was Kate Kelly. So she actually, her friends were the Kelly family and um, this was in the time that there had been um, uh, uh, red, red died there, the, the father, he died. And later on, they shifted to Greta. And there was a, another town that they had been to beforehand. And so um, 
that story was handed down by her through all of the family. And there are other stories of uh, finding gold and then hiding it because they knew that if uh, any of the troopers or any of the townspeople uh, knew that they had it, they would take it off them. And um, she talked about the gold stories. But uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, my story. I haven't gone, haven't gone too far over time. Um, Thank you so much, Uncle Vin. Now, I'm aware you've probably got more to say, Tony, but I think what we'll do is we'll go to questions and comments. And what I'd like to ask is that um, Indigenous First Nations people have first, have first go. Um, so um, if people want to ask a question, you can either ask verbally, uh, just raise your hand either visually and I'll look out for it, or you can click the um, the raise your hand under the participant button or you can post it to the chat and then we'll go to general questions. And just I'll just while people are thinking of questions, I'll just read out some comments for you, um, Uncle Vin. So um, thank you for your stories, a fascinating detailed history. Thank you. Thanks, Uncle Vinny, for that story. I just want to acknowledge that um, Vincent's my cousin and sitting beside me is my mother, who is the granddaughter of Lizzie as well. We are so lucky to have granddaughters still alive today. And up until a little while ago, there were seven of them when I first made these slide series. Uh, I think we've got five left. And, um, and they turned up to the family reunions and uh, it was wonderful to have them there. <coughs> Fantastic to have um, you and your mother here. So thank you for, for, for speaking. Any other Indigenous people that would like to make comments or um, ask questions? Not just about family, I can go into other areas if people have got them. Okay. So, uh, well, I'll just open it up to general questions now, I think. So, Nuri Alan Warung still recognised today? Uh, well, yeah, it's one of the problems that we had is uh, because people thought we were dead, and um, in, uh, in 1998, when the Yorta Yorta went for their native title case, uh, they lost. It wasn't that they didn't deserve to have native title. It's just that they, they hadn't been able to gather a lot of the information they need to become eligible for native title. And um, they had some of the wrong ancestors and the borders weren't right. And uh, so the state opposed their native title claim, and that's why they lost. And the interesting thing is, what they found wrong with the native title claim is that they had claimed um, the mm -hmm. country of the Nurela Murun. So it was known by the state government in that time that that was Nurela Murun country. And uh, one of them, they had their expert witness, and the expert witness went back to the diaries of the protector and the assistant protector. So the chief protector, uh, George Augustus Robinson, he had actually recorded the information in his diary where the Nurela Murung people were. And um, the assistant protector, the first one was at Mitchellstown and that was James Dredge and he'd had recorded it as well. So um, that combined with um, Kerr's reports and other historians, Diane Barwick was another one, um, they knew that the Nure Lumurung people existed, importantly, and um, where their country was. And when people started to make native title claims because of their lack of uh, knowledge, they incorrectly claimed the land. Um, so the state government actually realized that 
they had a legitimate claim. It's just that it was wrong. And they also realized that there was so little record freely available that they couldn't actually create a proper native title claim. So with good intent, the, the state government set up the Traditional Owner Settlement Act. And this gave you a way of making a native title claim without so much evidence. But what happened in the intervening periods is a lot more evidence was coming out. Aboriginal people weren't even allowed to look at their own files. Well, today that's not the case. And because of that growth of evidence, um, people are finding out who they are, where they came from, and who their ancestors are. Um, but government won't talk to you unless you set up a corporation. So the Nurel and Wurrung had to set up a corporation. We found four ancestors. We found over 450 descendants from those ancestors. And we think we're likely to get double that number with the amount of feedback that we've had. And um, so there's been another native title claim who claimed us. They claimed our ancestors. And that's, you know, it's made it difficult. Um, for us, um, we, we, we're not really trying to get anything out of it, but historic recognition. We want to be remain in history. Our people went through all of this. Uh, their lives were miserable and there were a few survivors and we want that story to be retained uh, for our country. And what's happened is somebody has put in a successful claim, but with the evidence that we we're able to track down, we had that claim uh, deregistered. And um, so they tried again and it was rejected. So what you have to finally do, even though the Traditional Owner Settlement Act allows for easier claims, um, if there is contention, you have to be able to prove who you are. So that's where it comes in. And we are able to prove who we are uh, thanks to people like the Melbourne Museum who provided us with so much history, genealogies and the additional research that we've done um, from those early writers like Edward Kerr uh, in particular. Um, Henry Bossens uh, wrote an excellent book and what he did, his, he actually, his book used newspaper extracts of the time. Um, it was first called the Waranga Chronicle. It was printed at Rushworth. And then later on, uh, it went through a, a series of different owners. But the newspaper was either at Rushworth or at Murchison. And um, under it, at different times, it came under different owners. So at one time, it was called the Murchison Advertiser. Another time, it was called the Goulburn Advertiser. And um, they were actually at Murchison and our people were camped on the river at Murchison. So when somebody died, they went there, they knew the story, the, the funerals, they attended the funeral and wrote up these stories. So there are a lot of stories that are so accurate from that newspaper. Um, we, we are fortunate to have them today and they've been used as part of our claim to our ancestry, our ancestors, in our country. Thank you, Uncle Vin. Now I'm just going to read a couple of the um, the comments from the chat, just for those of you that aren't um, multitasking. So there's one that says, "Thank you, Uncle Vin, for telling us about your family. We need more people like you telling us their stories. Us late arrivals, i.e., white people, are too ignorant of the real history of this land." And then there's other comments from people. Um, uh, I'm not Indigenous, but my grandmother lived adjacent to Corrindirk and all her playmates were from the station. Her stories were amazing and she absolutely loved it. And another one, I grew up in Marysville and always heard stories about Corrindirk and also had connections to the Indigenous families who were employed in the sawmill industry. Powerful presentation, many thanks. Learn, share, grow and advocate. Um, and then someone else asks Uncle Vin, are you putting all this in a book? This info can't be lost. Um, thank you for sharing your stories. I loved hearing when Lizzie took you to the circus. She suddenly became closer. Beautiful la lady. Um, what, what I've heard here has been very interesting and important information. Thank you for sharing. 
Um, and then a question, is it possible to confirm who the Indigenous people were whose lands were centred at Elmore? Yeah, that's uh, that's almost in a border region. Uh, the Nura Elam Wurrung consisted, well, from three to five clans. Edward Kerr said there were five Nura Elam Wurrung speaking tribes or clans. Uh, Diane Barwick could only find three. We think that the devastation lost them. Um, the the um, in that area there was um, it, it has several names. Uh, remembering that there were different languages, people doing interviewing Aboriginal people, if they interviewed somebody from another country uh, with another language, you got a different name, and so you got all of these different names. But the um, around that area, Bembadors and uh, or Pimpadors uh, were known to be there. Rushworth was more Conning Elms or Gunning Yellum, uh, Gun and Willem, uh, are also names that have been used. But they 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 moved all around the country, and because um, you we we did farming, but it wasn't. You didn't look on it as farming. It wasn't with a plough. You didn't do furrows, uh, but people did dig the ground. Uh, they the, the the diet was um, was uh, yam daisies and possums and and and, and fish. And um, uh, what you had to do was burn the ground every now and again. Um, the reason is that that put minerals and carbons back into the soil. And uh, still, if you if you do that, if you put ashes on on the ground, you're actually providing nutrients to the soil. So the soil was very healthy and it was very soft. And later on, it was trodden down with cattle and sheep. Uh, but the soil in those days was very soft. And um, so if you if you actually had used up an area, you'd burn the country. So then they have to shift to another area. So you had this mosaic burning pattern. And with the mosaic burning pattern, you knew when they burnt the country. And you'd also know when the new shoots would be coming through. So um, you didn't have fridges, <laughs> but if you wanted to find fresh fruit, you knew where which country to go to, how long ago it was burnt, you'd go there and you would find fresh food. So you had to walk all over your country from that ancient farming technique. So um, they spent a lot of time um, down at Seven Creeks, um, uh, a lot of time um, uh, on, the, on the east as well as the west side, uh, Waranga and Rushworth. And Tony Ford, um, I was so grateful to meet Tony. He's, written, he's done a lot of research through the newspapers and he's working through that newspaper has always had this history available in old newspapers and um, and found heaps more story that I didn't know of. Um, yeah, so um, that area, uh, I hope I've, I've answered your question a bit about why. Um, it, it, it wasn't always stationary, but Pimpadors, uh, Pimpadors um, the, but it could also have uh, Gun and Yellum or Conning Yellums there at times and um, because they all visited each other. And um, yeah, but that would be mainly, mainly that area at the, the uh, Elmore Gornang area. And probably Gornang is, um, um, I, I hope that's how you pronounce it, um, in the local area. Uh, it's, it's almost the border area with the order and Bangarang. Um, oh, sorry. You go, go Joe. Vinny, someone asked where um, Rochester was. Is it on the, it's on the cusp of Banarang and um, Jar Jar, but you know exactly whose country it is? You know, it's, it's, it's that border area. Um, when we talk about borders in Aboriginal terms, uh, you had a core country and you've got to remember that your, what your mode of travel was. There were no horses here. So your mode of travel was always on foot. So it took you a lot longer to travel anywhere. 
but people traverse this country. And um, Bunurong people from down along the uh, Port Phillip Bay coast and, and, and further, uh, Wathurong people from Geelong, uh, the Mordialli tribes, they all moved through this country. So you had to have places where you could walk freely. And song lines were used as a way of remembering those maps. You didn't have books. Everything was carried in your head. And if you think yourself, I'm sure there's people here can remember songs from when they were children. You remember those songs and, it, and, and, and your early teenage years, you remember songs that are only from your era. So a way to remember, you use this mnemonic, you had song lines and you actually had all these maps and that maps told you not only the routes, but it told you what the foods were and where to find them. And um, so um, that was uh, um, what enabled people uh, to travel. And with these wide borders, those border areas in the song lines were used by everybody. So there wasn't any fence line border that if you crossed, you'd get speared. That just this wasn't in it. But if you wanted to go closer into core country, what you had to do is use a message stick. That message stick was taken by um, uh, uh, somebody responsible for that. And it was given to the chief of, of the tribe you wanted to visit. And he would give you a message stick that you could take back. And by swapping those message sticks, you knew you had consent to enter the country. So um, the borders, it, it, that's a border area between uh, Bangarang and, and Yorta Yorta around Rochester. And, um, but generally what happened is people didn't live on that as such, but they hunted there and went back to their core country uh, at, at night time, unless they had permission of the neighboring people. Now, I'm conscious of time and that um, many people have had to leave. So um, even though we could listen to you for a very long time, <laughs> Uncle Vin, I think we should give you a rest. Yeah. So if people would like to join me in thanking both Uncle Vin and Tony for a really um, fantastic, informative presentation that's just really transformed, if everyone can thank them for their <laughs> great thank talks. You. Thank you. Um, thank you. And we will, um, the Goldfields Regional Library will post the link to the recording once he's edited it, which means it would be great if people can forward it to, you know, friends, family, school teachers, etc., just to increase the um, education around the really important stories we've been hearing tonight. Um, so thank you very much for coming. Um, next month, the 11th of November, will be the last Discovering History Seminar for 2021. It will be both face-to-face -face, um, and online, subject to um, COVID caps. Um, the topic will be rural motherhood and the creation of a rural women's community via women's letters to Miranda at the Weekly Times, um, presented by myself. Um, if you want to be on the email list for the seminar and you're not currently on the list, you could just post your email uh, to the chat you can just uh, send it to me as the host or whatever so thank you very much um, for coming um, and thank you very much Uncle Vin um, and Tony for a really great um, presentation thanks, thanks everyone thanks Tony thanks everyone bye <laughs>